Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Sami Assad, as you know. Apologies that I've been terrible on learning Germans. You've all got to listen to my very bad accent in English. But I'm going to talk to you about my research looking at frogs and deforestation. Uh, but first things first, I'm going to take you to my favorite place and play you my favorite sound. So this is the tropical rainforest in Borneo. And that sound you're hearing is like dozens of different species of frogs all calling together. Although more specifically, that's dozens of different species of frogs all talking about sex. <laughs> Now, each one of those species has a different area of the forest that they utilize. They have different food sources, different places where they breed and live. And by variations in what they need, you can have dozens of different species in one habitat. But at the moment, there's a bit of a problem in frog paradise. We're in the middle of basically a frog apocalypse. 200 species have gone extinct in the last few decades, and now about 50% of all amphibians are threatened with extinction. But the problem is, when you think of like extinction and endangered species, you always think, you know, the big famous mammals, you know, oh, don't ah, don't ah. <laughs> you have elephants, gorillas, pandas. Uh, and you know, while these species are certainly threatened, they're certainly serious threats to their population, It doesn't even come close to the threats to the entire amphibian family. So why have we overlooked amphibians in favor of, you know, bloody panda? Oh, look at its little face. Well, <laughs> a big problem is that amphibians have got a bit of an image problem. I mean, when you think of frogs, it's charming in its own way. When you think of amphibians, you know, everyone thinks of like slimy, like poisonous, weird little creatures that aren't really worth your attention. But unlike another cold, unfeeling creature, such as Theresa May, uh, thank you. <laughs> I mean, unlike that specimen, they're actually essential for the function of tropical ecosystems. Amphibians are essential predators of invertebrates. I mean, globally, they consume tons of mosquitoes, spiders, and flies yearly. So if you don't want to be just, you know, crawling around with bugs all over the place, it's going to pay to keep frogs around. So they're providing a vital ecosystem service. <laughs> But I mean, what else are they good for? Well, if you think about a pristine habitat, frogs are incredibly sensitive to pollution and temperature changes. So if you start to lose the frogs, you know you've got a problem. And in that way, they serve as an indicator species. They're an indicator that you've got a bigger problem on your hands and you need to intervene. So they have that for them, and all Teresa's an indicator of is that my country's going to shit. <laughs> and the last thing, which arguably I don't know if you'll agree with me, but I mean, they're pretty cute. Look at his little, look at his little blue hands. <laughs> Teresa, on the other hand. <laughs> so hopefully now you kind of understand how important amphibians are, although to be fair, I'm not entirely sure on their stance on Brexit, but we're going to assume it's great. So, you know, hopefully now you understand the plight of amphibians, how serious their decline is, how vital they are for our ecosystems, and now you couldn't care less about the goddamn panda. <laughs> But if we want to understand this decline in amphibians, we need to look to where amphibians are at their most abundant and why they're declining there. And that takes us to the world's tropical rainforests. Now, these contain the most abundant areas of amphibians, uh, but they also contain uh, most of the developing nations. That's where all the rainforests are. And these nations need to utilize their forests. They need to fund infrastructure and development. And to do that, a lot of them utilize, uh, they utilize logging. So basically going into a forest, extracting the wood and the timber and selling it on. I mean, that's great for funding development, but unfortunately it's pretty disastrous for the amphibians. So what if there was a middle ground? I mean, obviously unlogged forests, ideal for frogs, conventionally logged forests, so you just take everything you can, great for funding infrastructure, but you decimated your amphibians. What if we could try sustainable logging, where we take only the amount of timber that we need, or a smaller amount, and it tends to work for keeping our amphibians? But to really get sustainable logging right, we need to know exactly why amphibians suffer following logging. We need to know how they respond to the different changes. So to help explain that, I'm going to introduce you to my tropical rainforest. Give them a little applause. I mean, not too much. They're not done anything yet. They might mess it up. Okay, so as you can obviously see, this is a tropical rainforest. And uh, if we go kind of, we venture into the jungle. Basically, underneath the canopy, it's quite cool. The temperature's constant. We're sheltered from the sun. Uh, and it's quite moist. It's quite wet. There's lots of food. And within this forest, we have an amphibian community. 
This is an amphibian. We're going to call him Pete because I'm not going to bother you with Latin names. And he spends his time living in the tree roots and foraging on the floor. This is Steve. He spends a bit of time on the forest floor looking for beetles and worms. But he also ventures into the canopy and exploits resources up there. And finally, we've got Fran. She keeps to herself. She's a tree frog. She spends her entire life in the canopy. Now, if we leave the forest, sorry, it's cut off by the map here, but outside the forest, it's really hot. There's no trees to shelter us from the sun. It's dry, it's arid, it's a tough place to make a living. But if you're a generalist species, like old Greg, Greg here, he's a bit of a tough boy, he can hack it out in the sun. So we have like a nice little harmonious community here. But what happens if we start logging, if we start extracting the maximum amount of timber we can? Well, All right, well, the first thing that happens is, you know, we've lost Fran. She's a tree frog. She spends her entire time in the canopy. She's got nowhere to go. She's out of it. Okay, we've still got Pete and Steve, but with the increase in temperature, which is obviously caused by the lack of that canopy, Pete's kind of struggling. He's not used to such conditions. Steve, on the other hand, is doing all right. They can still access their resources. But because it's warmer, Greg now, he gets in on the action. He wants some of these forest resources. And Pete, he's not used to this competitor. He can't keep up. Boom, he's out of it. So what's happened? Well, by taking the trees, we've massively shifted that community. But what's important to note is, it wasn't just the loss of the trees that led to the decline in amphibians. Fran obviously couldn't hack it, she's a tree frog. But Pete was mostly severely affected by the increase in temperature and the introduction of a novel predator. So if we can have our forest back, rise again, forest. Yeah, that includes you, come on. <laughs> Don't give him up, I've never done anything yet. Okay, so what if we could manage our forest differently? What if we only extracted a small amount of timber with the ultimate goal to kind of keep the structure still functional? Well, let's just say we take out one tree. Okay, well, first of all, we still get to keep Fran. She still has access to canopy resources, the bugs and the tree holes in the canopy. Steve and Pete, the temperature's increased slightly because we've lost some of that canopy, but we have enough intact that they do okay. They can still survive. They can still access resources. Although Greg, obviously, he wants a bit of the action. It's a bit warmer. But because it's not so much water, Pete still has a good foothold. So does Steve. And also, now that the canopy's still here, Steve can utilize resources in that canopy. So what's happened? Well, by taking a smaller amount of timber, we've maintained that forest structure, but we've still had an effect on that community. But not in that we've lost species, we've gained one. But the interactions between those species have changed. And that's where my research comes in. I'm essentially wanting to look at how those effects are driving the amphibian declines, and most importantly, how we can advise logging and do it better. So currently, I've been working in the Duramacot Forest Reserve in northern Borneo, and uh, this reserve only utilizes sustainable logging. However, they had no idea how that affects amphibians. So after eight months of stumbling through that jungle and getting bitten and falling down and getting leeches places, you seriously don't want to know where leeches go. <laughs> but after eight months, what we could find for our preliminary data is that sustainable logging seems to work quite well for amphibians. We found as many species in this logging reserve as there was in two national parks adjacent to the reserve. So it looks like sustainable logging is a real option to preserve amphibians. What's important now is understanding those fine scale effects. How does sustainable logging compare to conventional logging? And if we can understand those effects, we can guide logging. And that means we can manage our forests for people and for frogs. Thank you very much, everyone. Let's give it up for the jungle. Sami Asad and his team. Special applause to you guys. <laughs> and of course, for the frogs. Thank you. <laughs> vielen, vielen Dank. Und ihr seid wieder dran. Zweite Wertung des Abends für Sami Asad. Zwei Minuten Zeit, ein bisschen Musik von Dirk und wir hören uns gleich. <lacht> 